We were hearing there from Italy about the use of local lockdowns to tackle the virus. Is that going to work all the way through winter, do you think? Is that a solution for winter in the, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere? Well, I hope so. It, it does appear to be a good strategy. It seems to be working here in the United Kingdom. Uh, once you've flattened your curve, you can just keep flattening it as little sporadic uh, outbreaks come out. You use a localized approach so you don't penalize the entire country. I mean, in theory, this is a great idea. In practice, we don't really know what is going to happen when the, the cold winter winter months come, when the flu virus begins to circulate. We just don't know. But I think it's a good strategy for now. Yeah. Yes, because here in Europe, many people are able to socialise outside at the moment. What happens when everybody disappears indoors, Jennifer? Uh, let me ask you about the difference between the uptick that we're seeing in case numbers across Europe at the moment versus the, the, the earlier spring surge and the initial uh, outbreak. We seem to see a younger profile to those who are infected. Now, how should we treat that? Should we be telling those young people to, to, to stay at home? Or is the fact that we're not seeing deaths associated with, to, to such a high degree, a comfort? It is, it is interesting, this phenomena of the younger, the younger cohorts now getting infected. But still, it's an awful lot of people being infected. And these people can spread to more vulnerable people. I think it's, it's not... It's a non-starter to have everybody stay at home, especially young people. But I do think social distancing and mask wearing will make a big difference. So, you know, the U.S.'s curve right now is starting to flatten a bit, but it's still a, a lot of cases. And, and we can have a lot of really bad effects in younger people that, that are not necessarily showing up in the stats. You can get really serious illness, long-term illness, and, and we don't even count these numbers, so we don't know how many there are. Jennifer Rowan with us, folks, and even though she is at UCL London, her pedigree in America is extraordinary, out of Oberlin into the acclaimed University of Washington science effort uh, out on the West Coast, just absolutely best in class. Jennifer, you're on fire on Twitter. Twitter. I'm not going to mince words. You got a Fahrenheit 4 or 51 illusion. You've been writing up about science and non-science as well. The non-science crew has a timeline impatience. They just don't want to wait. What is wrong with being impatient about getting to a good outcome? It's, we do so much hard work. We've done so much really good work with lockdowns. We flatten curves all over the place. And the minute you let up and you decide, oh, it's all over now, it just comes back. And it's going to keep coming back until we all get it under control. So I'm not saying we should all be sitting in our houses for the rest of our lives. But the people who don't want to wear masks simply baffle me. And, and even more, the people who are going to refuse to get a vaccine if we get one. This is it's, it's nonsensical. Why not wear a mask? It's clear that mask wearing is reducing the number of cases. So I, I don't understand this, this, this argument at all. Tell me about this debate, this confusion, this rather conflation of the search for a vaccine with antigens and also with plasma. These seem to be the, the words that amateurs talk about too much. To a pro like you, what are the risks of the conflation of different processes? Well, it's important to be clear, you know, plasma, convalescent plasma is a long uh, history of using that. But, you know, it's very limited. You take plasma from one person, you can't inoculate the whole world with it. And we actually don't know yet where, whether COVID convalescent plasma really is that useful. I mean, it's, it's something to try and people are, are doing tests, but certainly there's no hard and fast evidence yet that that's a good thing. Vaccines, on the other hand, you can, you can inoculate the whole world with a really high boost of, of, of antigen. And actually, it's, it's pretty much understood that if you get a natural infection, it's not going to give you as good as immunity as if you had had a vaccine, which is specifically designed to really ramp up your immune system. So they're two different things. Jennifer, one of our colleagues, Lionel Laurent, writing a, uh, an opinion piece this morning saying that what we really need that would change the game is a more effective treatment. We've got a couple of things that have been used, have been developed, have been found to be useful in treating coronavirus. Are you looking at anything, we've talked about plasma, but are you looking at anything that could be really significant? At the moment, we still only have these two drugs. There's a dexamethasone, a cheap and cheerful, very old drug that seems to to help to save some lives, a fraction of lives of people who are critically ill. And we have remdesivir, which is <clears throat> basically 
shorten the recovery time, but it is no magic bullet. That's all there is at the moment. We're looking at anti-immune uh, compounds. Basically, these are things that might quell or try to quiet down the immune system, which is what is causing the serious complications for the people who end up in ventilators. But no, at the moment, although a lot of things are being tried, we still don't have any new leads on that.